an entire native tribe that disappeared into thin air with fire still burning in their teepees. Giant dark creatures from the woods that terrify villages or make people mad. Cannibal mountain people that look more like dwarves than men. Explorations to find a mysterious vault in the Nahani Valley leading to underground ancient secrets. All this and more on this episode of Metaphysical. If you go into the Nahani Valley in Canada, don't whistle in the woods because you'll either terrify locals or you might invite something even worse to hunt you never to be seen again. The native to Nahani tribe, the Dene, recorded another tribe called the Naha in their oral history. Naha natives were recorded as much bigger, stronger, and more warlike than normal native Indians. Who were they? And the question remains, what fate did the Naha succumb to in their sudden disappearance? I was searching the J.C. Brown cave area and going to this site where I knew that J.C. Brown was camping out, which is near the cave. And I brought this friend with me, like have to hike in a couple miles, but we get out of the car in the forest where the car is parked and we're walking along the trail. And out of nowhere, he just starts whistling. He's just whistling and he never, he never whistles. What are you doing? What are you doing? Stop whistling. It was the weirdest thing. I almost thought something came over him to cause him to whistle, you know? Yeah. Like what, what, especially if he's never done it before, that's bizarre. Like, is there something there that's yeah. like prompting him to do that? You know? Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. Well, and, and as you guys maybe do or don't know at home, whistling in the woods is a really bad idea. <laughs> Listen to your elders, listen to the old stories and don't whistle in the woods because it and could invite why is it a bad idea? Some of those things will use whistling as communication. So don't do it. Actually going to be talking about in this episode today, the Naha, this strange tribe. Now the story goes that the Dene people in the area recorded battling with the Naha people. The Naha were bigger, stronger, and warlike. And the Dene you have to understand they had this very rich oral history all about the land in the Nahani Valley. The Dene would abandon camps at certain times of the year and take shelter on islands. So it sounds really strange, but they did this out of terror for a brooding creature in the lands they called the Nakani. The islands they thought would protect them from the Nakani who were unable to cross the water to reach them. Now, these Nakani were cave dwellers who hibernate for winter. They were allegedly twice the size of ordinary humans, placing them at about anywhere from 10 to 12 feet. And they never missed a chance to carry off unwary hunters or stray squaws in their powerful gorilla-like arms. They are said to hypnotize their victims and to evoke feelings of dread. Reportedly, in a 1950 description from Philip H. Godsell in the book, The Curse of the Dead Man's Valley. Now, this is where a lot of that comes from. Now, in one of their stories, the Dene went to attack the Naha because they were losing too many people to the Naha. So they did what many strategical humans would do. They staked out their villages and one night planned to go in and attack. After days of watching the Naha people nonstop, they finally decided to go in. To their surprise, the entire village had vanished. The entire Naha tribe disappeared into thin air with the fire still burning in their teepees. So when I say the entire village vanished, I don't mean like their homes. Those were all still there. Everything was there, but the people were gone. It's in their oral history and nobody knows what happened to these people the question remains, what happened to the Naha tribe? Did they flee and migrate to the south where they became the Navajo people? Did these Nakani kidnap them and drag them away into the, into the Nahani forests? Or was there some other worldly explanation? And this is the part 
of our episode or one of the many parts of our episode where we're going to hear from our remote viewer, John Vivanco and his team on what they actually found, because what we want to do is get to the source of what are these mysteries? What what is the answer to these mysteries? Can we shed any light on them? With a lot of this stuff, with a lot of these things, it's just the same story propagated over and over. It takes on a life of its own and it turns into this massive mystery where they're actually in the remote viewing data is not so much of a mystery. There was no other monster that came in and ate them. As much as I'd love there to be that stuff, there's no aliens abducting them or going to another dimension. We do sometimes see other beings, tribes, when you get to like the Waga tribe that was related in some fashion to Mount Shasta area, did go to another realm. But these guys, this, this tribe, they basically just packed it up, left their stuff and took off. They, they trudged away because of the danger, because they were in a location that was <clears throat> difficult to live in, for one thing. They were under constant pressure by warring, especially warring with these others and warring with the elements. And they knew that the other tribe was going to attack them, was watching them. This tribe left. They just left the area. They were done with it. No more for them. So it's it's actually most likely to be true that the Navajo that we see down south actually is a descendant of these Naha people. There you go. The, <laughs> they went they to have a similar pastures. <laughs> yeah, and they have a similar language as right. well and similar characteristics to the Navajo, which is really, really interesting. And, you know, a lot of people think that that's impossible. It's like, well, how, how do they go from, you know, being up, so far up north and getting down there, I guess they just went for the long march. I mean, it, it obviously would take them probably generations, many generations. But at that point, you know, according to our data, they they wanted out because of the threats. They left because of the threats. Like they they strapped stuff onto their back, what they could carry with them, and got out. So they were like, it looked like they were in a valley. They were in uh, a location that was down low, muddy. Uh, water flow, it was dark. And then we have them trudging uphill, like up a switchback, up a switchback, getting to the top of the hill and then going like in a southerly direction, just leaving, completely, totally leaving. And that's like, those are the very descriptive core elements of all the data that we have on what happened to them. Since there is that connection with the Dine, the, the Navajo in language, and well, that's a very strange thing to begin with, because that kind of thing doesn't happen. So, so I would surmise, yeah, that, that, that the Dine are what is, are what the Navajo, that's also a name for the Navajo, right? The no way. D -I, I did not know this. Yes. D-I-N-E. Dine, right? I, I think that's how you pronounce it. So sorry if I'm like totally massacring that, but that's another name for the Navajo. So there is some connection up there. And with these tribes in general to the Navajo down in the Southwest. So the, here's the one thing with these stories is that you, you get one slice of moment in time, but in my experience and what I see in the data is that these tribes were more intermingled <clears throat> than you can imagine, right? Not just, not just because not just like this tribe had disappeared, right? These tribes were actually more intermingled than you can imagine. And you've got, offshoots of the tribes that go out and form their own little um, clans and groups, and then they begin to fight each other. And so you have one slice of a story. But if you dig deeper, I'm sure there are more stories that connect these tribes more into one. It makes total sense. It's like, look what happens when you get like in the Roman Empire or whatever it is. You've got different different generals and different warlords can or different leaders of different areas can oftentimes take part in civil war against their own people that are in right. different areas. Like why would the Navajo, the Naha or the Dene tribe be any different? You're going to have people that want more that do, they, they see a different path and they want to take that path. And then maybe that was it. Maybe the, maybe the Naha like really wanted to go down South. They wanted to stay up there and there was more warring or more politics going on than we know. I mean, we don't even know what happened, you know? I think a lot of it, like you said, is politics. A lot of these stories are 
just a tiny slice and the the politics are much broader than what you can possibly imagine. But yeah, nothing paranormal. And you guys, you may be disappointed in the outcome of that, but we're just getting fired up here. There's all kinds of stories that we're about to get into. What made Annie Lafferty go mad, shedding her clothes, scaling walls and crawling on all fours in the Nahani Valley? Were these mysterious Nakani involved? Kind of the whole rumor and legend of this Lafferty girl. So supposedly in 1926, Annie Lafferty was traveling with a group on a hunting trip into the valley. Annie disappeared in the night, but they found her trail into the woods. The tracker struggled, though. Shredded clothing was found hanging from trees, but the track stopped at a high and rugged cliff. Did she somehow travel up? Her trail was found again further up the top of the cliff, but there was no easy route to get there. Now, local hunter Charlie approached police with his testimony. He saw Annie. He'd woken up to the sound of rocks, so he investigated and found a naked girl running on all fours up the side of a cliff. Her movements were like an animal. She was grinning and looking around before continuing to drag herself upwards, upwards, sending rocks tumbling into water. Charlie, this guy, was horrified and thought he would dreamed it until he heard of Annie's disappearance. Now, here's where we're not sure what happened. Some say her name was actually May and that she just went by Annie. But we found an account of a very similar story in a 1933 newspaper that it seems like maybe all of these weird legends spun off from. Is this the true story of the Lafferty girl? A famous trapper led a party to visit the valley. One girl named Nada Lafferty wandered into the woods. Nada could be a typo. It might have been Nadia. We're not really sure. Here's a quote. One of the others saw the girl running through the bush and field hastily, organized a search for her. For days, the men sought the girl, firing their guns at frequent intervals in hopes of attracting her attention. Indian trackers were brought in to help. They found traces of her, portions of her clothing strung along the line of her flight. Flight meaning her path of, you know, skulking around the Nahani Valley. Now, the article said uh, for her flight, there was no explanation nor has her fate been learned. This could be where the legend of her literally flying came from, but in reality, it meant she had fled. Everyone in their party left except one man, Ed Clausen. And what's weird is he found traces of humans from 20,000 years ago who had migrated from Mongolia and Asia to North America. But what's even weirder is that for some mysterious reason, Clausen refused to explain why he wouldn't examine the cave dwellings he discovered. They supposedly corresponded with the dwellings found in New Mexico and formed the first trace of the Mongol migration between the Mackenzie River and the southern U.S. So to recap. In a real newspaper article from the 30s, a girl goes missing. The one man who stays behind finds mysterious evidence of an ancient dwelling, but refuses to say why he wouldn't explore it. And then legends spring up around the whole thing. What really happened here? Man, that article just like took a weird turn. Right. Didn't it? I mean, OK, so we're talking about a woman who took off. They're searching for him, but then the guy finds ancient structures and that doesn't want to talk about them <laughs> what well and what's well, we weird too is like you know this part where they're like he found like was this just sensational like he found evidence of humans from twenty thousand years ago like our own scientists can't tell me when something was five thousand or ten thousand years ago they're telling me it's five thousand and it was like a hundred thousand well this guy knows that you know yeah, maybe layers of tundra uh, washed away or something and like guesstimating the, the time frames, the geologic time frames uh, based on the layers, maybe. Um, I, you know, I think that's actually quite an interesting uh, area, though, the ancient dwellings that resemble those in the southwest, like the Anasazi, because the, here you have that previous story of the tribe disappearing, but our data suggests they left and went south. So, hey. Well, uh, you know, that's an interesting little connection there. But as far as, you know, this this person goes and trying to figure out who this was and what happened, it's it's just like it's a mess in the data. And usually when it's a mess in the data, it means that 
it didn't happen. <laughs> so this was like a, a yeah. sensational story just a made sensational, up. Sensational story. I would lean towards that because usually things are more succinct if there's something that happens when we look at this stuff. Like when you have data that goes all over the place and goes into just nothing going on to the machinations in someone's head to, and every, all the data is different. What it's telling you is that there's nothing here. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, many people thought that this Lafferty girl was hypnotized by the Nakani or the Nahani Valley Bigfoot um, that we mentioned, whether she saw one or not, what, are these bizarre creatures and is there any truth to their existence? We'll be getting into that next, but go ahead, John. There's like these stories of, of um, creatures hypnotizing people in general, but as far as we've seen with the Nahani Valley, it's very, very little on the, on the high strangeness side and more on the story side, more on the sides of propagating the stories out to the to the world in order to keep the area closed down which i really think at the end of this video you guys are going to understand better because john and his team found some very very strange things up in the nahani valley so don't go anywhere we've got more to talk about here and next we're going to be talking about what the heck is this nakani figure we're talking about a giant sasquatch like brown to dark red hair being or creature that has a foul odor. You know, this thing has allegedly left many fearing for their lives. All the people that encounter this thing, they claim that it provokes an intense fear or feeling of dread when they encounter it. There are also claims of bizarre cannibalistic mountain men in the area. And these were described as fur wearing primitive people who cooked the bodies of their victims, like Neanderthal or something like that, no more than five feet tall, and have long beards. You can imagine, actually, this sounds less like a Neanderthal and more like a dwarf from Lord of the Rings. They were like called Nucklux, or meaning man of the bush. But again, it sounds kind of like a strange dwarf, too. Around 1964, multiple women witnesses supposedly saw a small, dark, upright hominid creature covered with black hair. A trapper was approached by the creature. It looked strong looking. It growled at the trappers and then it just fled into the trees. Now, one thing we've heard over and over is that you don't whistle in the woods, right? Like we talked about that first thing in this episode. You got to listen to this, John. Now, in 1876, a guy named Father Emile Petito lived with the natives. Quote, they live at times in continual terror of an imaginary enemy who pursues them without rest and who they believe to see everywhere. Now, this being lurked outside settlements, whistling and making noises resembling human laughter. This were their claims. Now, listen to this. Trader B.R. Ross in his 1879 report, notes on the Tine or Chippewayan Indians of British and Russian America, quote, a strange footprint or any unusual sound in the forest is quite sufficient to cause a great excitement in the camp. At Fort Resolution, I have on several occasions caused all the natives encamped around to flock for protection into the fort during the night simply by whistling hidden in the bushes. My train of hauling dogs also of a large breed of great hunters would, in crashing through the branches in pursuit of an unfortunate hare, frighten some women out gathering berries who would rush in frantic haste to the tents and fearfully relate a horrific account of some strange painted Indians whom they had seen. It was my custom in the spring during the wild fowl season to sleep outside at some distance from the fort. Numerous were the cautions that I received from the natives of my foolhardiness in doing so. Okay, so are these just a figment of the local tribe's overactive imagination, or is there something more that's happening in the lands of the Nahani? It's like when there is a um, rumored haunted house. And you have a lot of people going into that house. 
where the the actual haunted part that that occurs in people experience is a lot less than on the side of ex people like psyching themselves out right and so th it's it's like literally the tribe had gotten to a point where even if they heard any whistling they'd run for cover now like when you get into other native people lore yeah you have the stick indians who whistle and and lure you into the forest or a baby crying or a baby laughing somewhere in the forest and the intent is to lure you in and quite often these stick people look like uh, some type of Bigfoot or hairy person, right? Sometimes they're small statured, sometimes they're large statured, but they will often use those methods. And a lot of native native lore have this story. In fact, I have a, a friend who took a video at one point uh, in a certain area out in the woods where there was that whistling going on. And the intention is to draw you towards that whistle and get you lost. The, the people were experiencing it, they did experience it because in that area, you still have a lot of Bigfoot type creatures that, that can, can be small and they can be large. There's many different renditions of them and they were hassled by them like a lot of native, native cultures were, right? I mean, some cultures will <clears throat> place them as being friendly and some cultures will place them as being evil and dark. And in that area, they seem to be of a more darker frequency not everything is that right all of a sudden any little sound becomes it and you get you know goosebumps in the dark kind of thing right it's like the the ghost shows these days don't you think these legends would have come from some reality of this at some point well, it in does history? come from a reality absolutely that's what i'm saying is that their reality because these things are so elusive the reality like ghost hunting the reality becomes everything is that now right that's why the in that story the um the priest i think that was a priest in that story he that's why he tested it out and whistled and they ran right it was trader b ross who was kind of hiding in the woods and freaking them out and seeing what would happen yeah but it go. was the father um emil petito who lived with the natives and was kind of you know sharing what their right lore is Right, right. So basically, yes, it's based off of a reality. We've seen that, that reality of these types of creatures who live in that area in the whole Northwest. Okay, so explorations into the valley have only caused more confusion and given way for ever more questions. Why would explorations be so well financed just to find a few new mountains? Accounts from different explorers have alluded to a warm oasis or tropical area existing due to the hot springs in the area, a perfect environment for Jurassic sized animals and beasts from a different time. Or perhaps these fantastic stories are hiding something even stranger in the area. What did John and his team find? A vault to somewhere otherworldly? Well, I gotta, I gotta set this up with a little bit of, uh, of, you know, some foundational storytelling here of what's going on. In the late 1930s, Champlain Oil Company sent the chairman of their board on a daring expedition. He was a guy named Harry M. Snyder, an explorer who had been to the Arctic four times before, and he had spotted a strange, mysterious mountain range that nobody could reach. Snyder set off with nine companions, including his wife, and the best pilot in the entire Northwest, Lay Brintnell. And they went on a 450 mile journey. Of course, it was tre treacherous. Some of their party had tried to travel by boat and nearly lost their lives. Meanwhile, local Indians avoided this Nahani country like the plague, the paper said, as we've been hearing, right? Brintnell's flying record was almost unparalleled in Canadian aviation. Snyder said he flew them over jagged, unmapped peaks that rose 10,000 feet in the air, and he did it seven times that summer without any accidents. There was a legend that in the area was a tropical valley with 10,000 hot springs, 30-foot-high ferns, and temperatures that never went below 50 degrees in winter. But Snyder's experience was just the opposite, and he said he met the man who had created that story himself. Snyder said there were only a few hot springs in the whole area and that they had no effect on the temperature, which was extremely cold. 
But there's still more reports of this warm oasis um, that we need to go through. This is Valley of the Dead Men that was in Daily Star Weekly in 1933. Listen to this. Tropic of the North. Indians don't enter the valley, but leave offerings tied to trees and rocks at the mouth of the valley because they want to placate evil spirits who, who keep the climate cold. The valleys aren't actually tropical, but heated by numerous hot sulfur springs. Birds winter in the area. Quote, flyers who have visited some of the valleys have said that a man could live there in pajamas all winter. No sources given on the statement, though. So this is all we could really find. The hot springs account for reports of semi-tropical oasis. Is there really a tropical environment in the Nahani Valley? And what doorway has John and his team found there that no one talking about the area has ever mentioned? Well, you know, the, the whole tropical environment side, um, I don't think so. I think that I think that this is fueled by the hot springs in general, where you might have little areas here and there that can stay relatively green, maybe all winter. I mean, look at the Japanese hot springs, you know, the, the ones I think around Mount Fuji or I'm not sure exactly, maybe Osaka, where it snows and the monkeys sit in the hot springs all winter, right? And there's snow all around. I think pretty much something like that is what you have. And you have condensation going on, microclimates because of the heat and causing these mysterious fogs to all of a sudden form and whatnot. And then people will attribute that as some kind of strange paranormal phenomena, but you know, not really this, you know, this Valley is just, it doesn't quite deliver for me on the side of strange paranormal phenomena because we just don't see a ton of it really not, not any at all. Um, and more going down the path of trying to keep people out. Other people are trying to keep other people out. So but why make you know, these fantastic stories about like crazy oasis in the middle of the desert, strange creatures, gold, yeah. you know, as far as the eye can see, you know? Yeah, I don't understand why those stories are created because we didn't really see anything that was legitimizing those stories in remote viewing data. Just didn't. And maybe this was something that came from the deep past. Maybe this was like where where two historical time frames are crossing over. I mean, the idea of dinosaurs and this place being an oasis or a slightly warmer oasis with warmer water in the high north allowed certain species to live a little bit longer in the area before they eventually passed on and the native tribes carried that remembrance forward and so it becomes this story this legend that expands and grows who knows i don't know um they those definitely wouldn't keep me out right i mean if everybody lost their head when they went there that would keep me out but stories of dinosaurs i'd go look for those <laughs> that's what i'm saying yeah yeah oh they're talking about woolly mammoths that were able to live there and fantastic beasts like thunderbirds or pterodactyls that people have seen and it's all due to this like strange oasis it's all very similar to this admiral bird story that you and i have covered on previous right. occasions some people have even said that this area leads to inner earth which yeah of course why not we've got various things going on here but nothing I can grab onto until we tasked upon what's the most mysterious thing in the valley, because we're not finding a whole ton of mystery, right? So when we tasked on what the most mysterious thing in the valley was, what was described was, again, the valleys described this big cliff wall, right? And, and in the ground is like a vault doorway. This is coming from multiple sessions, multiple remote viewers who are blind, right? Is a metallic doorway and there's like debris covering it, partially covering it. And under this doorway, there's honeycombed metallic stairways that go down into this natural cavern where the cavern is originally natural. And within this location is... Well, what looks like, according to the data, is some type of monitoring equipment that is extremely high tech. And the whole idea that this is an unmanned base. And when I say high tech, high tech, this is not technology that's human made. 
So this is some type of monitoring facility for this area that something else has set up. So the data talks about like an alien species. And when you get to the, the far north, and we, we have these other episodes on Alaska, we have the same kind of stuff show up where we have these sort of like alien type bases that are up in those regions in those areas. But this one seems to be more like unmanned and semi-abandoned. But now when we looked at like where, like where is this location in reference to the landmarks of the area, what was described was a mine, a, a mining operation, right? So, that, so the big landmark as to where this thing is that goes underground, vaulted with equipment and technology in it that not, is not necessarily human made is in an area where there's a mining operation occurring with a lot of tunnels going in, with a lot of machinery working it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And so when you look at the Nahani uh, Park, which is a national scenic area, mind you, the Canadian government has carved out an area in the middle of it in a national scenic area for a zinc mine. Yeah, right? there is a zinc mine up there. They make right. like four hundred million dollars a year off of this zinc mine. That immediately what I thought about when you said what was around this area. And I'm thinking about this mine that they have up there where they're excavating all kinds of stuff. I, like we've worked other projects where we have mines in these projects. Um, and when they, especially like when you get into the gravel pits and the pit mining stuff, sometimes these mines can come across things that the greater society and culture would, would, would never believe in, would never, ever believe in ancient civilizations, lost technologies, out of place parts, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems as though this place came across this thing, came across something. That's why you have an area that nobody's allowed to go into. That's why the mine is plopped in the middle. Of course, you've got great resources there. And in fact, when you get to alien races that are coming to this planet, a lot of it is hunting for those resources. So one thing that we see in remote viewing data is that the, the aliens will come in after humans have left mines as well and go at, go into these mines and, and kind of like get what humans can get out because they don't have the capability yet they already dug, right? We see this in projects. This seems to be maybe a little bit opposite here. There's something on the flip side going out on where humans have found what they have left potentially in mining operation, potentially in monitoring operation, but are no longer using it. And this is, was meant to be vaulted off too, because a lot of the data was like, it's a vault not supposed to be gotten into. Right. So that's what, you know, that's like, that is very interesting and very curious because it's not often that you designate a place, a national scenic area, one of the highest levels of protection, and then literally stick 40 tons of cadmium in the middle of that mine system in order to process the zinc that's coming out of it in the middle of a nas national scenic area, right? I mean, the toxic uh, stuff you have to bring in to, to process this find is huge. There's something deeper going on and it relates to that. It's real. It's this really strange, but you know, when I found this zinc mine <clears throat> that they were excavating and I found the base there that was doing it, everything inside of me was like, this is a front for something else. You know, to be fair, maybe it was like all of these claims of the mysteries that were up in the area that made me feel that way. I don't know, but think about the parts of our world that are underwater, under sand, or that have never been seen before because they're too far north or too far south like what is under three miles of ice in antarctica like if we were to know what was actually there we would be shocked never mind you know this area in the nahani valley that has a strange vault in it maybe this processing center this strange vault where they were monitoring things was to monitor some of the, the natural resources yeah that's definitely we get some aspect of that in the data and one thing you have to understand is that that intelligence services of any country, and especially the Western countries, are very, 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 very interested in potential locations where there has been alien activity and what sort of technology has been left behind. Always. It's for the, it's for the technology. 
So exactly. So yeah. much so like when you look at the great pyramids of Giza, for instance, you had SRI, Stanford Research Institute, who created remote viewing, a CIA intelligence research organization investigating the pyramids of Giza. For entertainment purposes, though, right? It was for entertainment purposes. Investigating the pyramids of Giza for many years to try to find ancient technology, right? Funded, right? Along with the remote viewing program, actually in, in coordination with the remote viewing program. And you have to wonder too, you know, you had SRI remote viewing program called Stargate. And they're also at the same time searching, you know, with, with technical equipment, the pyramids at Giza. What were they doing? Looking for a Stargate, perhaps? <laughs> Maybe as one of the things, but I mean, it's the whole thing is this all like crazy technology we don't understand. And like we've right. been told, we've been told 0.5% of the entire story about those pyramids. I mean, yeah. even even like, you know, as you and I were researching and developing shows on Alaska, I mean, I was left completely, completely confused about that entire Giza area and what it relates to. And if you guys haven't watched those episodes, if you're interested in more weird in the Northern Territories, go check out our Alaska episodes because we figured out a lot of stuff, but we found things that we can't explain that we're going to have to get into at a later time with the pyramids, especially. Now, this was it. Like, this was the craziest thing was this vault. Did you guys see anything else? No, I mean, that was it. And, and the vault was actually pretty limited in size. It didn't necessarily branch off into other, other tunnels. Um, but what I believe part of the mine's operation is, is searching for more of this stuff in that area. And that's, you know, I mean, they're, they're a legitimate mine. Absolutely. But this is a sort of a secondary or probably the, the first operation of it on the back end. And, and it's so compartmentalized that people working there aren't going to know. Uh, but this is the reason why you have a mine in the middle of a national scenic area, highly protected area, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, if you guys are watching this episode, we hope you're enjoying it. Please definitely leave us a comment below and let us know what you thought of this. We've shed some light on a lot of the mysteries revolved around the Nahani Valley as we've gone through this episode, and we've highlighted some things that no one has talked about. We'd love to hear what you guys think. Uh, John, thanks so much for being with us. And for those of you at home, we hope you guys thought this episode was as out of this world as we did. Mm -hmm.